Hey guys, how are y'all? Are you awake? You sound very asleep. You don't sound very awake. <laughs> Does the snore indicate that you're awake or asleep? A combination of the two? Awesome. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and, you know, I've got this prepared um, based on the four questions, and I think Michael's got those, and he might pop those up for us there, the four that we're covering tonight, supposed to cover tonight. Um, and I was going, I'm taking the first two. How do you know God's calling and will for your life? Pretty big question. And then how do I keep my faith from becoming lukewarm? And I think those go hand in hand because if we're striving to find God's will for our life, if we're reading his word, if we're doing the things that he's called us to do, our faith is it might stagnate, move toward lukewarm, but it's not going to stay there, you know. And then Emily is going to have the one dealing with doubt. And Sam's already kind of addressed that tonight. That definitely plays into the situation. And how can I make my prayer life better? Because that plays into everything. Um, so you all right if I just punt everything I've got written down here, Sam? Uh, you know, and I obviously didn't. I prepared right before to do this. But I just think, I just want to share with you from my heart kind of where something like this has a real impact on us, and it should. You know, if I think back, I was I was saved at eight years old, and I went forward at VBS and accepted Christ, and, and I knew I needed a Savior. I knew I needed a relationship with Christ. I didn't really completely understand about walking with Him and making Him Lord of my life every day, this finding God's will for your life. I mean, it's almost like we think when we accepted him that's all there is but you know i had a conversation with actually a student today we we're talking about this once we accepted christ we start to live eternal life at that moment it's not like we're walking through this life and then all of a sudden a door opens and we go into eternal life once we have that relationship with christ that door is open and we're walking that path to eternal life, to eternal relationship with God. And he's got things for us here that are good and that he wants to bless us with. But because this world is broken, because sin came in, there are bad things that happen in this world. And the bad things can impact us just as much, if not more sometimes, than the good things. And I'm just going to share some kind of what I call milepost in my life some things that have mattered to me and that how that's pushed me toward finding some of God's will for my life. I'm still searching. I'm a little older than most of you, maybe. I'm older than the combined age of the front row, probably. <laughs> Close, maybe. Um, but it's still searching for where God wants you to land. You know, when I was 16, my grandfather passed away from a heart attack. I was on the golf course playing golf for Fullbush High School and the coach came out to get me and to take me back to the clubhouse and that was big in my life because he was a pastor and I spent a lot of time with him and that really was the first time something like that had abruptly changed my life and you know at the time I didn't see it but God used that and the things that I took from his life have changed the way I try to live my life. When I was in high school, um, we had a young lady that was a year older than me who was a cheerleader, was top of her class, and sometime in her senior year, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she didn't live very long after that. But man, she lived every day with joy. 
And she lived every day trusting God and praising Him. And I learned from that. You know, I went off to college. I went to college for the wrong reason. I went to college to play football, and I didn't need to be playing football, and I didn't need to be going to college for that reason. But God took me in His will to a place where I met Kara, I met my wife, I met other friends who helped me see what it meant to find God's will and to live a life for Him. A lot of things have transpired over the course of my life, and we don't have time to share it all tonight. But I'll just say to you this thing about finding God's will. You see, there's this part of what Nick shared this morning. There's this common will for all Christians that once we've accepted Him, God has this plan that some things are common for all of us. You know, worshiping God, praying God, Studying his word, being together like this in community. He created us to be in community. And to be together and to learn together, to love each other, to support each other. Those are common things he's called us. But when we start talking about God's will, I mean, the questions we want to ask are, what's my job going to be? Who am I going to marry? Where should I go to college? Where am I going to live the rest of my life? What am I going to make on that test next week? You know, we want those specific questions. But I would just encourage you, yes, you should pray and ask God for those direction in those things. Please, yes, for sure. But there are things that God has shown us, that he has revealed to us, that he's called us to do, that when we start doing those things, when we start loving other people unconditionally, when we start coming to student group and doing what y'all do, connecting with each other, It's been amazing to see the way that has just grown over the past few months and to see how you've connected and changed lives through doing that. And to understand that those things, because see, I think sometimes, how many of you feel like God sometimes plays hide and seek with his will for your life? I mean, yeah. We feel like that, don't we? We feel, but the truth is, God wants to reveal it to us a lot of times more than we want to find it. Because, see, finding it sometimes puts us out of our comfort zone. And it puts us in a place that we hadn't planned for. But when you get to that place where God wants you to be, that's the place you're going to find peace. So I would just encourage you tonight with a couple of things this situation and as it ties into finding his will for your life. God plants people in a lot of different places. I mean, I asked some of these leaders earlier. I mean, Kayla cuts hair, hair, hairdresser, beautician for a living, and you said you, you encountered how many people a day? 20 haircuts a day, 20 people a day. As Jake back there, he's a foreman. He encounters anywhere from five to ten people a day. Talking to Garrett and to Jacob, I mean, they might encounter 30 people a day. The same thing with Kayla. Those are, that's part of God's will. To bring people into our lives for us to have a chance to impact their life. For us to have a chance to love them and to show God's grace to them and that's a part of finding the things that God has for our life because I said I'm not going to go back and cover all this but God's general will for Christians we need to strive to be fulfilling that and as we do that then he'll reveal more specific things to us about where he wants us to be planted and what he's called us to do and I just encourage you to keep growing in that Because God has a plan in it. And to trust him through it, even in times like this, that are sad, that maybe you're asking that question that Sam mentioned earlier, why would something like this happen to a family that we love so much, to somebody that we cared about so deeply? Why would he allow that to happen? The only answer,
answer is, is this is a broken world and this is not God's plan for us. Our hope is in Him and that we have eternal life with Him and that one day we're going to spend eternity with Him. But while we're here, He wants us to live as best we can following what He's taught us. And these two verses, I'll just read those two verses, Michael, if you from Romans 12, 1 and 2. Because I think they're really important. And I just challenge you this summer. And just challenge you to please read these two verses from Romans 12, 1 and 2. Memorize them. Study them. Pray over them. Because they are a life-changing framework. And it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Because, all, because of all he has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So let him change our heart, change our mind, and then that can change our life. So that's what I would encourage you to do, to just walk through that, even in these difficult times, to trust him and depend on him, and lean on him, and lean on these people around you. These leaders love you. They care about you. They're here for you. God's got them in a vocation somewhere else, and they got an opportunity to love and to witness to people there, but they choose to serve here in a place where they can walk with you and to love you and to care about you and to lean on you. Sorry, I messed up all transition there. That's okay. Um, so kind of like Sam had already mentioned earlier, we've, we've got a lot of questions about doubt in general. Um, and we're going to look at that. I'm going to hopefully attempt to kind of answer those last two questions. How do I deal with doubt and how can I have a better prayer life? Kind of at the same time because those two end up being pretty closely linked together. Um, and so I'm going to kind of start, I'm going to start a little differently than I had planned to. Um, but I, uh, when I think about doubt in my own life, there are certain stories that kind of pop into my mind immediately of like times in my life that I've experienced real doubt and just honestly sat before God and been like, I don't get this. I don't understand what you're doing. This doesn't make any sense. Like, I know you're who you say you are, but this is awful. And I do not know how to get myself out of like the funk that I'm in right now. Um, and the, the first story that popped to my mind, even like his dad was talking, I think he probably will pick up on pretty quickly where this is coming from because he walked through it with me. Um, but uh, some of you know uh, Austin Mace Moore um, or knew him when um, when he was with us. Um, but growing up, the Mace Moors were some of our best friends. Um, <laughs> I could sit and tell you a lot of really interesting stories. Um, if you knew the Mace Moors, then that's not a surprise to you. Uh, I have a very vivid memory of Austin uh, running around at a mission trip in a Mountain Dew box and work boots. And uh, there's some great pictures of that. But when I think of... Um, season of my life where I really struggled with doubt, um, watching Austin, uh, who was a year younger than me, uh, walk through having cancer again after beating cancer before, but walking through it again, um, it's an 18, 19-year-old. Um, it was very, very difficult to watch someone that I loved and uh, had had such a big impact on my life to watch him suffer and then eventually to lose him. Um, but where the doubt came in for me was maybe different than I think I would have expected because uh, I had grown up with Austin and we were really good friends. Um, he was really close with my brother, but my family was here when he started getting sick again and they were able to see him on a pretty regular basis and... Um, were able to just sit and be with him, and I wasn't here. Uh, I had, uh, I was away at college. It was my sophomore year, and um, had a lot going on 
at that point when I was in college, a lot of like weekend obligations and I couldn't come home. And um, I'll never forget waking up and getting a phone call from mom telling me uh, that Austin had passed away and when the funeral was. And I remember, uh, first of all, just trying to process like what had happened and the shock that I felt and just the disbelief and not really even knowing what I was feeling or what to think. But I also remember hearing what she was saying about, like, this is when the visitation is, this is when the funeral is, and processing, like, I can't go home. Like, I can't leave. I I have to stay here. And feeling this, like, immense, like, frustration with myself and with my circumstances and with God. And I'm like, like, Austin meant so much to me. Like, God, why would you work out the details of my life right now so that I can't even go be with him and his family? Like, this does not make sense to me. Um, And I don't even know if you and mom know this, but I ended up at some point that week having a conversation with my brother and talking about, like, you know, just (laughs) what I was feeling and what he was feeling and trying to process it all. And in the midst of that, my brother, who I did not always think gave very wise advice, um, said to me that if Austin was talking to me right now, he would tell me to shut up and go have fun. (laughs) And I just remember trying to like reconcile all these different things in my head. But the reality is that I wasn't frustrated with God's will. I wasn't doubting God's actions. I wasn't doubting who God was, I was mad that God's plan didn't look like I wanted it to look. And when I look at this question of doubt and even talking about prayer, I think a lot of our frustrations with it and not really knowing how to handle, like when we do have doubts or when we don't really know how to pray and don't feel like it's a big part of our life, it comes back to the fact that we're not comfortable being dependent on God we really enjoy being dependent on ourselves. We really like being able to look at the world and say, like, I got this, I can handle it. And when moments come up in life where we can't handle it, it's a lot harder to surrender who you are and your plans and your preferences to God and say, I'm going to let you handle this. Um, And so really quickly, I kind of want to, walk you guys through um, an example of this in scripture that has really meant a lot to me. Um, I've come back to this story over and over again in my life, really to answer these same two questions. Um, So in the book of Mark uh, chapter 9, there's a story about this father who brings his son, who is demon-possessed, to Jesus and his disciples and is wanting his son to be healed. And when we think about, you know, Think about your parents. If something like that was wrong with you, I imagine that your parents would probably do everything they could to get you the help that you needed. And I'm sitting next to my dad, and as I read this story, I'm kind of like superimposing my dad into this. And I'm thinking about like if that was me, I know that he would have gone to the ends of the world to figure out how to help me and get me out of the mess that I'm in because he loves me. And so this father takes his son to Jesus and his disciples because he's like, if anybody can heal my son, it's, this is where I've got to go. Um, but when he brings his son, the disciples initially are the ones who kind of try to heal the son and cast out the demon, and it's not working. And so Jesus steps in, and there's this conversation that happens. Um, it says, so they brought the boy, But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. 
Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. So just a couple of things that I want to touch on from this story that I think directly relate to what we're talking about. Um, When it comes to doubt, I think it's really easy for us to be like, okay, if I have doubts, then I must not really know Jesus. That's not true. There are so many times in Scripture that we see people who love Jesus and are like, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, but I've got this whole list of questions. Having doubts doesn't mean you don't know Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've also probably got a lot of doubts too. But if you do have a relationship with Jesus, I don't want for you to sit there and be like, oh man, well, I've got this question, this thing about God that I don't understand, so that must mean that like when I got saved, I didn't really mean it. That's not true. We get to see in this story that this father like had enough faith in Jesus to take his son and travel by foot to get his son the help that he needed. And when he was face to face with Jesus, it kind of came to the surface. Like the father had to be honest. He's like, look, there's part of me that believes you and part of me that doesn't. Help me deal with this part that doesn't. And Jesus' response to that was to show him. Like, yeah, I'm capable. When we have doubts, when we have questions, God is gonna show up. We do have to be looking for it, and we do have to pay attention. But if we've got doubts and we're honest about them, if we take them to God and we say, like, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's going on, but I need you to step in. He's going to show up. Having doubts doesn't disqualify you from being in the presence of God or from being used by God. Um, But kind of going off on a little bit of a rabbit trail, I think that one thing that's really important to notice from this is that he showed up and Jesus is the one who addressed his doubts and his unbelief. We've got to be really cautious when we do have doubts who we take those questions to. When I was growing up and I had doubts, I can tell you there was a big difference in the advice that I got from my parents when I asked them questions about God and when I asked my friends at school. Because there was some wisdom that my parents had in life that people my own age might not have. There's also a lot of wisdom in knowing like, hey, I've got a question about Jesus. Maybe I should ask this question to someone who's been following Jesus for a while. Maybe I don't want to go ask someone who believes something totally different than me. Maybe I want to talk to someone about it who is trustworthy and not someone that I think could use this to hurt me or could tell me something that's going to be harmful. Um, Just as kind of a side note, it is really important when you're dealing with doubt to be conscious of who you're letting speak into your life. Um, But to kind of finish up the end of this story, we get to see that, like, Jesus stepped in and healed this boy. He kind of address the doubts that the father had, but he did still heal this boy who is very much in need. Uh, And people were amazed by that. And the disciples eventually went to Jesus after this all played out, and they said, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we heal him? Why weren't we able to drive out that demon? And Jesus looks at them and says, this type of affliction can only be healed by prayer which may seem like a pretty simple statement, but it points out something really, really important. The disciples weren't praying. And I think for a lot of us uh, in our walk with Jesus, we're like, yeah, I mean, I'm a Christian. Of course I pray. Like, I I talk to God. Like, I pray. It's important. But do we really? Like, we'll pray before a meal or when somebody... Uh, is praying in a group, we like bow our heads, but like are we really like talking to God? And I'm not saying that to like point a finger at anyone. I'm so guilty of that, and the disciples were guilty of that. But when we think about our prayer life and how to have a better prayer life, the simple answer is to just start praying. And that may not sound like a very profound answer, 
But the reality is most of us, when we ask how do we have a better prayer life, we want somebody to give us like five magic steps to make us want to pray more. And that's not how this works. You just have to start talking to God. Um, there's a, a song that I've been listening to a lot lately that kind of addresses this, and there's a part of the song that I want to read to you guys because it really simplifies this idea that, like, if you want to have a better prayer life, if you really want to know Jesus deeper, just start talking to him. And it says, there's no wrong way to do it. There's no bad time to start. It don't have to sound pretty. Just tell him what's on your heart because it's not a religion because it's more like a friendship. Just talk to your father like you're his kid. Just start talking to Jesus. And that has been really impactful for me. Um, just to remember that, like, when I get frustrated and I think, like, man, my prayer life isn't as strong as it needs to be. I need to fix it. I need to do all of these things to, like, have this really strong prayer life that other people want to imitate. But honestly, I just need to remember to talk to him. Because he didn't intend for prayer to be this, like, eloquent thing that we've got to spend 30 minutes a day sitting in a closet to do. He wants us to talk to him all the time. It's a conversation. And those disciples forgot that even though there was this really big thing going on that they wanted God to give them the power to do, they weren't talking to him about it at all. They weren't depending on God to step in. They were trying to do it on their own. And a lot of times when we're like, man, I don't feel like my prayer life is really strong, the simple reason it's not is because you're not talking to him. And I have, I had this whole list of like really practical ways to help you kind of like try to lean into that. But if I'm being honest, I feel like it's more important to just take that one thing home. When you're dealing with doubt, when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you're happy, when you're thankful, whatever you're experiencing, God wants to hear about all of that. And if we could get used to just talking to him without feeling like it's got to be some grand planned out conversation. You know, like when somebody starts praying and the way that they talk instantly changes, you go from this kind of conversational tone to, dear father, please help me to get through this thing that I have to do today. Like we don't talk to people like that, right? Do you, that's an honest question. Do you talk to people like that? No, but we get so formal with God that we forget that like God's listening right now. And if I'm being honest, I can sit here and just say like, God, this has been a really long week and I'm exhausted. And everybody's sitting here listening to that, but like that's part of my conversation with God. Getting used to just talking to him can be one of the most impactful things um, and it, it genuinely will change your life if you can get used to just talking to him. All right, so we'll, we'll Lee kind of just leave you there. And I know that's not a really great place to just leave you. But I would just encourage you a couple things. One, start doing the things you know God wants you to do. And when you do those things, he'll keep revealing his more specific will to you. Don't think you've got to fast forward to the end. Just serve him where he's got you now. And love people where he's got you now. Pray daily. Have that conversation with him. Don't be afraid to ask those questions if you have doubts. Don't be afraid to ask God. Don't be afraid to ask people that you know are mature believers. Lean on those people and trust them. Now, I'm going to pray, and then we'll see what Sam is going to do this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity to gather, and Lord, um, for the freedom you give us just to explore your word and, Lord, to try to share it. Lord, you want to give us the best that you have for us in this life, and Lord, that's in your will, and Lord, you've revealed so many parts of your will that are common to all of us as believers, and Lord, help us to strive every day to follow those. Lord, as we do those things, you'll begin to reveal more specific things to us, and 
give us more specific opportunities. And Lord, just pray that our that our prayer life would increase and would grow. And Lord, that we would have honest conversations with you and share whatever is on our heart with you. Lord, you already know it, but you want us to share it. And Lord, then to wait and to be still and to listen and to hear back from you. Lord, help us to see you in all we do. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.